Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, in an embarrassing twist of fate, the onion suffers from an embarrassing compromise, and the attack appears to match a new pattern. We'll share the details. Plus, picking the right open source load balancer, Google's new aggressive disclosure policy, a big batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. And welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 112 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on May 30th, 2013. This episode's brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hello, Alan. I know I get a little excited hey. about Scale Engine sometimes. I got to be you honest. Do. Well, I should because my entire business runs on top of it. So kind it's, of. <laughs> I, if I'm not excited about it, then I've, that's probably a bad sign, right? Right. Yeah, I would think so. Alan, mm-hmm. uh, guess what? Big show. What? Oh, I, did, you forget I that the, did you forget that the roundup is not supposed to be huge? Because this week, the roundup looks like it's ginormous. Well, the one story just has a lot of links is all. Yeah, like 30 links. <laughs> 13. Settle down. <laughs> All right, I exaggerate a little. Well, there bit. was only three in there, so I added, I threw in like four more. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I know, but they're good uh, ones, and they're yeah. they're big you, too. You had you had three items, and I added mm-hmm. four more, mm-hmm. and just the fourth one happens to have thirteen links. A lot of a lot of stuff to cover this week. So, all right, well, we should probably get right into it. There's a story been floating around that, surprisingly enough, hasn't made it onto any of the Jupiter Broadcasting shows yet. So I'm glad you're covering this. And if I got this right, so the the accusation goes as such: the Free Syrian Army gets control of the Onion's Twitter feed. Is that right? Basically. Well, if you remember, back in episode 109, uh, which is a couple weeks ago, uh, we featured an article published on The Onion called The Onion's Tips on How to Prevent Your Major Social Media Sites from Being Hacked. I do recall this. Right? And they talked about all the things you, basically because they're a satirical news magazine, they listed the things you should do, such as firing your IT department and a bunch of things like right, that right, in order right. to get hacked. Very tongue-in-cheek. Yes. Uh, but... That was published on May 6th. As it turns out, starting on May 3rd, the Syrian Electronic Army was making its way into hacking the onion. Completely unrelated? Just to, that's just ironic? Basically, basically yeah. Well, basically, uh, the Syrian Electronic Army had hacked a uh, number of other sites. Okay. Like I have a list here at the bottom. Okay. Uh, the BBC, the Associated Press, The Guardian, The Financial Times, ITV, CBS. Some of these have happened since... Uh, the Onion, like Sky Broadcasting, had their Android app hacked. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, and I it, heard about that. And a, a different version uploaded to Google by the sounds of it. <laughs> oh, really? You've made it to the, up to the, uploaded Into to the, the Play Google Store? Store yes, no apparently. kidding. Um, so anyway, uh, starting on the 3rd, the Syrian Electronic Army started its operation to infiltrate The Onion. <laughs> so they started with a very simple phishing email. Um, if you have the link open, you see so, like a picture of it. I don't know if that's the actual email or just an approximation. Okay. But basically it came from a random outside email address addressed to a couple of people at The Onion and said, here, you should see this interesting story or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And it, the link looks like it goes to the Washington Post, blah, 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 The Onion, right? So it looks like the Washington Post was talking about The Onion, right? Um, and so a couple of employees clicked on it. Rather than it actually taking you to the Washington Post, though, it took you to a hacked WordPress blog, mm. which then redirected you to this other site that would prompt you to enter your Google Apps credentials, right? So it basically try to log you into your Gmail. Uh, if you were dumb enough to type your <laughs> Google credentials into this box, which a small number of people at The Onion were, oh. uh, then they compromised your Google account. Uh, basically, um, they said uh, a quote from the, or, uh, the Onion's team was, these emails were sent from strange outside addresses and they were few enough, uh, or sorry, they were sent to few enough employees to appear as just random noise rather than a targeted attack, right? It didn't get sent to every employee or anything. So, you know, nobody in the IT department got one, so they didn't know that this was happening. Uh, but at least one Onion employee fell for this phase of the phishing attack. Right? So somebody clicked the link and uh, you know, somehow decided that, oh, logging, having to log back into my Google, even though I just clicked the link from inside my Gmail, uh, that's normal. 
You know, so I would anyway. almost almost think like because you know when I click a link at Gmail, sometimes it goes to this redirector page first, and I would think, oh, maybe something got screwed up, and I have to relog in. It's probably going to reload. Yeah, my or I, my session timed out. Or yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would I could almost fall for that just because I would just assume they broke something. Yeah. Uh, so once the attackers had compromised the account of one Onion employee, uh, they used that account to send a more convincing email to a, a lot more employees. <laughs> right? Because yeah. now the email's coming from inside the Onion. It looks like a legit so, source. And it's not a forged email, right? The from address is actually from the Gmail, not from uh, ex- outside pretending. Right, because uh, Google signs all the email, right? So if you send email from your Google account, it's signed to basically prove that it was actually sent from the person in control of that account. Mm-hmm. Now, in this case, the person in control of the account isn't the right person, but the email is legitimate, right? Uh, so, you know, if you work at The Onion, you get an email from somebody, uh, and it's legitimate from somebody at The Onion, you're less likely to think it's spam and more likely to maybe click on the link, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so this more convincing one compromised some additional accounts. <laughs> At least two employees entered their Google app credentials into that rogue website, and one of those two people happened to have access to all of the Onion social media accounts. Aha. Uh-huh. So once they got so, that... So now the, uh, the uh, Syrian Electronic Army has access to the Onion's Twitter account and right. is posting silly things. Yep. So... After the attack was discovered, the IT security group sent out an email to all employees telling them that they should reset their passwords. <laughs> right? So, so they get back control of their Twitter account and tell everybody, you have to reset your passwords. <laughs> sure. This is where the really funny part comes up. The attackers, right, the Syrian Electronic Army, used an additional compromised account that they had, like another employee that they hacked that the IT team didn't know about, yeah. uh, to send a second uh, password reset email. Uh, to all employees, including a link disguised as a password reset link that would fish them again. Get them again. Right? So in this case, when you click the link, you are expecting to have to type in your password. Right? Because you're expecting to go to your Gmail, enter your old password, and then enter a new one. Yeah. Right? Uh, But the attackers purposely removed all the people from like the tech division and the IT security group and everybody else that might realize this was a phishing attack. Wow. From the list. So they only sent this uh, second password reset email to people that weren't going to be suspicious of it. That's pretty insightful. The less sophisticated users, right? And because nobody in the IT security group got the email, they didn't know that this email had gone out to everybody. How do you suppose they knew who was in the IT security group? Well, I'm guessing the way their distribution lists work, right? There's like a list for editors and yeah. a list for writers and a That's list for IT people, right? So you just pretty good. exclude certain people. Yeah. Right, because like when you have access to a Google Apps uh, for a company, they, right, you have these distribution lists and like departments. And everybody's organized into groups. So you just choose which groups to send an email to. Uh, th- so that final attack compromised employees' accounts, uh, including another one who had access to the Twitter account. So now their Twitter account basically got hacked a second time. No. After they gained control of it, they lost it again. Uh, so in total, the attackers compromised at least five different accounts. But since the security group had no way of telling <laughs> how many more accounts might have been compromised, yeah. <laughs> they forced a password reset from the admin side. Mm. So they changed everybody's password. And I'm assuming they had to manually provide employees with their new password. right? Rather than having employees go and change their password, the administrator set them a new random password and then had to provide it to them, not through their email since they wouldn't be able to log into their email, uh, and then they would have to set a new password again. So these are so this is supposedly the the Syrian Electronic Army, which is uh, uh, aligned with the Assad regime. They're yes. hacking the Onion for because the Onion had posted a bunch of stories about. Making fun of the Syrian Electronic Army. What a weird, and, what a weird thing to have the Syrian Electronic Army focus their attention on right now. You know, I just had all the things they could be doing, but I guess they well, want to raise they were, awareness. They they, they used uh, the Onion's account to to post a bunch of stuff, right? Like about Israel and so on. Or if you remember, they used uh, when they hacked the Associated Press, they used that to say that the there had been an explosion at the White House, right? And they wiped yeah. out 186 billion dollars worth of stocks value and so on. Yeah, I remember that one. Uh, so the Onion's uh, editors decided to have a little fun at the expense of the attackers and published an article uh, about 
the death of the Syrian electronic army people at the hands of the rebels <laughs> in Syria. Uh, and I have a link to that there. Uh, and the Syrian electronic army responded to that by posting some confidential emails they had gained access to when they hacked the Gmail accounts. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> well, hmm. Uh, but the Syrian Electronic Army has also taken credit for compromising numerous other media outlets, like I said, the BBC, the Associated Press, The Guardian, The Financial Times, ITV, which is a British TV station, CBS, which is an American uh, TV station, and uh, they also hacked, what was it, the uh, 60 Minutes Twitter account, and Sky Broadcasting's Android app. I wonder if Anonymous is feeling the competition. Because, like, they're not in the headlines well, anymore. While I was Googling some stuff, I saw that there's actually the Syrian Electronic Army is in a battle with Anonymous about who can make the most noise or something. Well, I'm serious, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because um, they are getting the attention. Now, the Financial Times uh, actually posted a similar postmortem about the attack on them. Oh, okay. And uh, looking at it, it was remarkably similar. So basically, it would seem a lot of these organizations probably fell for exactly the same attack. Uh, so if you uh, look at the article from the Financial Times, uh, basically they got a phishing email sent to a bunch of people that looked like it went to CNN.com and actually, you know, appeared to actually be about the Financial Times. Or, I don't know, the URL is like uh, edition.cnn.com, blah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. us-fb-financial. Except for financials actually spelled wrong there. I just noticed that. Yeah, well, you know, they always do that, don't yep. they? Yeah, look at that. That does look, uh, it looks and legit. It, and it, and it uh, pointed to a hacked WordPress blog and then redirected through to something that uh, looked like a Google Apps. And it turns out the Financial Times also uses Google Apps for their internal email. And uh, they basically got hacked the same way. And then once the Syrian Electronic Army had compromised an account of somebody inside the Financial Times, they sent a fake password reset email. Complete with like the little Financial Times logo at the mm. bottom of the email footer and stuff. Wow, yeah. Yep. Wow. And the phone number. Yeah, like basically they must have found a, a real email from the Financial Times in one of the hacked accounts. And he used it as a template to send one that was very convincing. None of this stuff is impossible to do, but it's all clever. Yep. Layers of clever on top of layer. It's layers of clever, like a delicious cake. It really is. Hmm. I would, you know, honestly, some of the stuff I think I'd fall for it. Oh, apparently uh, the Financial Times uses Splunk, which is an open source, well, partly open source log analyzer thing. And apparently because they're a big enough customer, they have access to a team at Google who can analyze the logs on Google side. Whoa! And they go into, uh, you know, the, they set up IP restrictions limiting access to many of their systems from within the Financial Times network. Uh, the compromised Google accounts were all deactivated by Google. Uh, Twitter locked the Financial Times Twitter accounts and changed their credentials. And they, uh, you know... Yeah, people are starting to coordinate like and, and respond quick. Uh, yeah. Which is good, and kind of shows how the private industry can sort of mobilize that action on their own without, even though legislation is stalled out, um, you know, mm -hmm. for that kind well, of Well, you, you can't legislate a solution to this problem. Oh, you should tell that to Washington. <laughs> I know. But the problem is people are dumb and click links they shouldn't. <laughs> it is, right? You can't legislate human behavior, and they're exploiting the... I mean, even down to that, that signature in the email, that's, that's a psychological exploitation, exploitation of human behavior. That's, yep. that's part of clever hacking is taking advantage of the social cues we use in society to make something look legitimate and fancy. And, and they even yep. had a little disclaimer down there about, if you received this email, it, you know, I've seen those before, too. Yep. It's or just, uh, the original phishing email, the one with the fake link from CNN, says, this was sent on behalf of, like, yeah. Pearson Publishing. And then it had, like, their address and stuff. It's like... No, it was spammers never include the address of right. the company at the and, bottom of the email. And so a this phone must be number. Real. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, see, a little official disclaimer registered in England and Wales with a company number, and they even put the company number on there. Yeah. Like, and you can and put anything like in there because nobody's going to check it. As long as it's, exactly. as long as our monkey brains see something in there that looks legitimate in that spot that we all expect it, you know, if you're being, if you're just rushing, yeah, you, okay, sounds good to me. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, the attack in both these cases appears to be almost identical and basically a generic phishing attack. Then once you get inside, you use uh, the more trusted account to send out uh, fake password reset emails and phish more users. 
that is that is the clever one two combo, right? Where mm-hmm. you get all you need is one or two users to screw up. You get if you cast a wide net and you only need one or two fish, and then you use their email accounts. And yep. then you look legitimate and you bypass spam filters. You have a whole new set of security filtering applied to you. I mean, that really is part yeah, of and, the cleverness. Well, also, like, if you can get a person uh, to follow one of these phishing links, you could also infect their computer and island hop that way. Yeah. Right now, all of a sudden, you have a machine inside the network that's around that gets around those firewall rules and so on. Or put a key logger on there and just get their password when they log into stuff. Yep. Exactly. <sighs> But it's interesting to see so many uh, media outlets using Google Apps. And like in this case, it seems almost like a weak point, right? If, if they had, you know, Thunderbird and IMAP servers, then there's not the same system of... It's, it's harder to trick people and type in their password when they're used to having that in a client rather than in the browser. This almost sounds like one of those hard-to-define inherent security risks when you're dealing with remote systems or when you're using the cloud right but right I, like i can understand if reporters maybe are moving around a lot not always on the same computer multiple devices yeah and gmail has you know uses for a lot of that stuff well and they probably look at it and think well it's not like we're a a, a hospital with uh you know hipaa compliant data that we're transmitting so we you know well you, i guess they have sources places, to protect yeah some sources of yeah. uh, you know you know, if that's, and that, that's another, especially with like the Financial Times, I would think that they'd be worried about yeah. certain governments having access to their emails. You know, it definitely seems like it's something like as a newspaper, it seems like email is something you want to have in house so that you have 100 percent control over who has access to to see, you know, what's in some of those documents. Uh, slips in our live chat says maybe two factor uh, using two factor authentication could have helped here. Because if you because it wasn't a legit you, login page, then they wouldn't have. Yes, but if if the fake login page asks you for the two, second factor and uses it immediately, yeah, if they put it there, if they put it there, but it doesn't sound yeah. like in these circumstances they had it. Of course, eventually, if enough people started using it, they would do it, right? Yes. I mean, and they could just accept any number. <laughs> it would, you know, yeah. it would. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I suppose that was all. That's all it would take is just some sort of placebo. Um, Right, second well, basically, the second factor expires, but if you use it immediately to get a session. So, yeah, yeah, yes, having two-factor authentication would have made this harder uh, for the Syrian Electronic Army. But at the same time, reporters in the field that move around a lot, probably two-factor is a bit of a, an impediment, right? Yeah, it is. Like, if you have to have your cell phone at all times, like, you know, your cell phone battery dies. Sometimes. Well, and if you, you use a lot of thir- if you use a lot of third-party applications that maybe integrate with like you know industry standards to google services using crazy things like ldap and imap then mm-hmm. having two factor makes those things a pain in the ass too yep um all right alan your thoughts on that story uh not really but it it definitely seems that almost all of these media outlets basically fell for exactly the same scam mm-hmm. and it's simple fishing well remember we just covered the story about a lot of the tech companies that fell for that uh that ios uh, developer site that had the uh Whatever it was, a Java exploit. The Java exploit. Well, yeah, yeah, but that one, in that case, the user didn't have to do anything to get infected. Just right. go to the website. Right, yeah, that's there true. Was no use, that, that was a zero-day exploit. Yeah. That's different. I wonder how they work out these um, these behavior patterns where they can refine their technique so much they can count on people following a certain pattern. I wonder if they just, if it's a lot of trial brute and error, force. Or if, brute yeah. force or what, yeah. Yeah, you just, you basically send it to every news outlet and then jump on the ones that fall for it. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I just want to give a quick plug for our live stream. You can join us on uh, Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific for Eastern over at jblive.tv for a video or jblive.info for the audio stream, which we have a high, high quality version and a low quality if you're on 3G. And, uh, and it's even better if you can join us in our live chat, like our chat room is here, then you get to suggest titles and hang out with us during the segment breaks and all of that kind of stuff. Alan, I was thinking maybe we take a quick break and thank uh, this week's sponsor. What do you say? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All righty. Well, you guys know that's GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy.com, longtime sponsors of the TextNet program. We've got a great deal, and it's expiring, as far as I know, tomorrow. But you might be able to get it over the weekend. Sometimes Danica doesn't get in there to turn things off until Monday. Use the code TECH249 when you're checking out. You'll get a .com for $2.49. Think about that. 
Think about what you could buy for $2.49. Not a lot anymore, actually. But a dot .com, yes, my friends, you can. For tech, two forty nine. when you check out, you get that dot .com for $2.49. Or use the code GO32OFF3 when you check out. GO32OFF3 will save you 32% off anything in your carts. Maybe, maybe you know, you say, I got my dot .coms. Although, for $2.49, for $2. I think you could afford another dot .com. But let's say you got your dot .coms. You're wrong, but let's say you think mm-hmm. that. Get yourself an SSL, sir. Get some hosting. Get yourself something nice. Treat yourself and use our code GO32OFF3 when you check out, and you'll save 32% off your entire order. That's TechSnap249 and GO32OFF3. They expire very, very soon. So go use them while you can. And thank you to GoDaddy for sponsoring this week's episode of the TechSnap program. That's awesome to have longtime sponsors. Trust me. Yep. It's great. Uh, All right, Alan. So our next story takes us to Google. Funny how that works. And uh, we've talked a lot about responsible disclosure when it comes to Google's engineers. Have they given us some clarification now as a company? Um, Basically, they've changed the policy they set in 2010. Okay. Uh, So uh, in 2010, the Google security team established its guidelines for responsible disclosure, uh, which basically stated that when a researcher finds a vulnerability, they inform the vendor, and the vendor has 60 days from that notification to issue a patch or disclose the vulnerability to uh, the vulnerability to the public. Okay. Uh, failing that, if a patch or disclosure is not made after 60 days, the Google security team will support the researcher in disclosing the details of the vulnerability to the public themselves. Right. So basically, if the vendor can't be bothered after two months uh, to either acknowledge or to publicly acknowledge the exploit and tell people about it so they can protect themselves with, you know, mitigations and workarounds and firewall rules or turning services off or whatever, uh, then Google will take the step of informing the public. Okay, and that was in 2010. Yeah. Uh, But based on the growing security risk and the fact that some vendors are taking unreasonable amounts of time (laughs) to fix vulnerabilities, uh, the Google security team has revised their policy. If a vulnerability is being actively exploited, like currently. So basically that makes it a zero day, right? When we find it, it's actually being used to exploit people. Right. Uh, the Google security team will support researchers disclosing the vulnerability to the public after only seven days. Whoa. I guess if it's zero day, seven days can be a long seven days. Yes. Basically people are being actively exploited. Yeah. So yeah. If, there, if there can't be a patch for it or a fix or something within seven days, then people are better off knowing about it than not, right? So the, the Google team believes that after seven days, uh, when a vulnerability is being actively exploited, the general public and specifically the people who are being exploited are better served by knowing about the vulnerability and being able to take steps to mitigate it or disable the service or whatever until a patch can be issued rather than being kept in the dark. Uh, a quote here is, often we find that zero-day vulnerabilities are being used to target a limited subset of people. In many cases, uh, these targets actually make the attack more serious than a broader attack and more urgent to resolve quickly, hmm. right? So, like, we've seen that, that uh, Internet Explorer 8 Zero Day being used specifically against defense contractors and so on, rather than trying to target everybody on the Internet where, you know, there's some damage that can be done by that, but that's just an attack on everybody on the Internet. That's less of a worry, honestly, than an exploit that's being targeted on a, a small group of people. Right, like a specific industry or something. Yeah. And so basically, in those type of cases, the vendors would often be like, oh, well, they're only targeting certain people. We can take our time and whatever. And Google's saying, no, those people that are being attacked need to know that they're being attacked within a week. Uh, And so another quote here is, uh, companies should fix critical vulnerabilities within 60 days. Or if a fix is not possible... They should notify the public about the risk and offer workarounds. Hmm. That kind of sounds like they're policing the the web a little bit in that sense. Like when you start. Well, basically, this is guidelines that Google uses for their own researchers, uh, but also you know they generally provide not emotional but yeah. moral support to other researchers doing the same thing. It, it t- I I guess I like it. I guess part of me just feels like it's a little holier than thou from Google cuz I'm sure eventually they'll have something that goes longer than 7 days and you know they'll get called out on. But it, the but. Basi- it, well, if it takes more than 7 days, it takes more than 7 days, but it means the researcher should 
be allowed to tell people about it. Right? Under responsible disclosure, yeah. the normal rule was you don't tell people until the vendor has a fix. Right, right. And, and there have been some fixes that have taken like a year. Yeah. It just doesn't right? work. Yeah. So basically, it's just saying that vendors need to be on notice that we're only giving them 60 days. And if it's being actively exploited, they have seven days to either tell everybody about it or we will. So, but what if it's like in the case of Microsoft where it's going to take them a month to fix it? So well, now just everybody actively, knows about it. If it's being actively exploited, if your computer is vulnerable, would you rather know about it after seven days or know about it and have a fix after 90 days? I, I guess my answer would be I'd rather a thousand people know about the exploit instead of five million people. Right? Because right, if but, it's out there and there's nobody not, fixing it, right, then it's sort of but, worst of both cases. But if you know that it's out there and it's being exploited, you can, mitigate. You can block it or yeah. disable it. Right? Yeah, yeah. In, in in the cases of something that affects like a, we a web server or something like that, but in the case of something that affects, say, Internet Explorer, right? What if it's a problem that affects Internet Explorer that's going to take them until the next Patch Tuesday to fix? Then you should need to stop using Internet Explorer. <laughs> it could put some people at risk, but I guess you know, I don't know. That's tough. That's tough but to you're say. Less that. at risk if you know that there's a risk. If you don't know, you're even more at risk. But right? you're more at risk if more people know about it too. I'm not trying to advocate right, security. We're not, we're not saying security, that they're, they're going to provide the proof of concept code as well. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Just knowing about it doesn't mean you're going to be able to exploit it. You have to have some proof of concept code. Of course, then people will start but, hacking you know, on it. But this is this is under the condition where it's actively being exploited. There are already people right. who are hacking people be, with this. You know, Java comes it, to mind, right? Yeah, but then so does slow patching. Yeah, but you know, maybe it, maybe it'll put a little stink on these guys to get their fixes out faster. And right. honestly, uh, but again, it, you know, this isn't about getting the fixes out necessarily. It's about getting the information out. Yeah, yeah. Because but you, you need know, to get the fix. If there is another the Java zero day, maybe I will be less willing to use Java until it's fixed or something. Right. And I mean, maybe could we say the long term hope would be that people would just try a hell of a lot harder to prevent this stuff from happening in the first place because they don't want this to happen to them. Maybe. Yeah, but, you know, there's the kind of the nature of these is that it's difficult to find an exploit before it happens because... Yeah. If you knew about it, would you, wouldn't have, in the first, <laughs> you wouldn't have made the mistake in the first place. Exactly. You, it's like, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, as far as Google goes, I kind of agree with them in the sense that, you know, you can't just wait around and let these guys take as long as they want. That's not going to work. So. And, and, you know, most open source projects probably meet the seven-day turnaround on oh, yeah. On critics. Yeah. Oh, I think and so. so in the, in that case, why can't commercial vendors do that? Bureaucracy, which is not it's not excusable. Right. It's not okay. Yeah. So basically, they need to reorient themselves to be able to get these fixes out in a reasonable amount of time. They need to modernize and 60 days themselves. Days is more than a reasonable amount of time. And in the instance of actively being exploited, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just something. It's a reality. They just got to. They just need to suck it up. Yeah, basically. You know, it's it's. This is still different than full disclosure, right? Right, right. There are a lot of people that argue for full disclosure when you find an exploit, you post all the details publicly right away. Yeah. You know, and yeah, at least this yeah. gives the vendor seven days to, to notify their customers and stuff. Right? Like, especially if it's, it's more like an industrial control system, that seven days uh, before everybody knows about it could be a big difference too, right? You know, if they can just tell their 500 customers or 1,000 customers that use it, then. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, how do you say Schneier's last name? Schneier? Schneier. Schneier. Uh, you linked to a, to a post he's got here from, gosh, it was 2001. Yes. Well, this is like, the argument has been going on for longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but specifically, the, the Google article linked to this as the background. Uh, oh, really? Makes their decision make more sense. Okay. Look at them, huh? Yeah, Google knows what's up. Well, and specifically, this was uh, back when Microsoft was really trying to advocate giving them as much time as they want, and nobody ever disclosed a vulnerability. Right. In fact, he opens up kind of going after Microsoft right in his opening paragraph here. He says, Microsoft is leading the charge to restrict the free flow of computer security vulnerabilities. Right, that's his opening right. sentence. So basically, <laughs> nobody would ever... The way Microsoft wanted it in 2001, no one would ever publish a vulnerability disclosure. Microsoft would publish patches... With a full little footnote saying, yeah. you know, never giving out the details of what the exploit was. Right. Just saying, this patch fixes the potential for this problem. Credit goes to this guy for discovering. Like Apple still does, where they're yeah. just like, fixed a security issue. I've literally seen updates where it's bullet point, fix security issue. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's just disgusting. Right. Uh, where, and, you know, just as a, basically, this is a research community. It's academic, basically. And there's a lot of benefit for other people being able to read your research. Yeah. And Microsoft wanted that research never to happen. Whereas with responsible disclosure, the researcher is still getting to publish the details of the exploit, just not until after it's fixed. And so Google's kind of coming up with this middle ground to try to force the vendors to be more responsive. But less than that, just to make the users more secure because they would know about it, right? Mm -hmm. Users being users and IT people and security professionals. Well, it's more, yes, it's more uh, uh, IT people because end users are not going to read all the security blocks and so on. But Right. Not unless there are audience. Maybe, right. maybe our audience. All right, Alan, any other thoughts on that one? Okay. All right. Well, I want to give a quick plug for uh, last night's uh, Unfiltered. Not only was it our episode 52, so our one-year mark, but uh, mm -hmm. there's this big story that the press was running with over the weekend here in the States that uh, Chinese hackers, the and this time they're coming out and saying there's Chinese government-sponsored uh, hackers, went in and got Pentagon secrets and got like 21 different weapons designs and stuff like that. Um, and the timing around this is pretty interesting because it actually happened like back in January, but it's coming out right now for some specific reasons. We cover all of that in episode 52 of Unfiltered, pretty much out of the gate. So I think we have, uh, we have one story before that, but it's pretty much at the top of uh, episode 52 of Unfiltered. Some interesting stuff, a lot of interesting rhetoric coming out now about this. It's definitely things have stepped up. It's another level. Yep. It's new. Uh, Obama is meeting with the president of China next week in California to discuss, among other things, cybersecurity issues, and to basically say, hey guys, stop hacking us. So it could be a couple <laughs> interesting, uh, could be some interesting stories coming out next week around that. But, you know, some of the timing of the releases also seems like, oh, well, we're trying to push cybersecurity laws, so let's let on this and that and the other thing. Uh, so um, I'm totally drawing a blank on the guy's name. He sits on the, he's the chair of the Intelligence Committee, and uh, he was on CNN this weekend, and he said he's going to sponsor CISPA again, and that he's convinced they'll pass it this year. On, in, mm -hmm. in the interview. So it's coming back, folks. Um, probably later in the year, it sounded like, because he said, he said in this year, which I don't know if that means next month or if that means November, but right. that's what he said. All right, Alan, well, with the news all done, I think that means it's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of our website. Or even better, even though none of you did it this week, starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Okay, Alan, I got a little angry there for a second. Are you ready for our first email? Sure. All right, it comes from Q5Sys. He says, Alan, I just watched last uh, where you uh, reviewed BSD 9.1, and you went in some discussion on BSD jails. And then last had an episode last week where we reviewed Linux containers. I had a few questions. Which one do you think is more secure? From my understanding, Linux containers use a host kernel and use shared memory, a shared network stack, etc. Does BSD run a separate memory space and hardware stacks for each jail? Can there be a memory bleed between jails? Okay. Um, saying shared memory is a misnomer there. Uh, yes, they allocate memory out of the host's memory, but it's not shared memory, which is a completely different concept. Um, under FreeBSD, you have the option to virtualize the networking with a system called vImage, which basically makes virtual network devices. Uh, and use ePair, and you can... Basically, the jail will have its own physical or virtualized network device. Uh, the default isn't that. Basically, the default says you're allowed, this jail has access to this IP address on your physical network device. Mm -hmm. right? So it can't use any other IP addresses, and it only receives uh, the specific traffic. Uh, because, it's, because it's happening at a higher layer, right? It's not at the network layer. It's the applications uh, Basically, the API that an application uses to try to talk to IP addresses is filtered to the kernel and only lets it access the certain IP addresses it's supposed to. And for example, even though you have root in a jail, you can't run TCP dump and see other people's traffic and things like that. Aha, uh -huh, there you go. Uh, so what about like programs getting access to other programs' memory and things like that? It's completely isolated. Uh, there are no known ways to do that. Okay. And there haven't been in a long time. Well, there you go, Q5. Hopefully that answers your um, question. But yeah, as far as which one's better, 
FreeBSD jails have been around longer and there hasn't been an exploit in a long time, but I don't know really. Uh, Probably, I prefer I'll tell jails you, just because I'm more used to them and know how they work. If but. you need a Linux application, then potentially Linux containers are better. And if you need something that runs fine on FreeBSD, then potentially jails are just fine. But basically, yeah, <laughs> it comes down to what, what do you server need? do you have and what server you're already comfortable with. Right, right. Um, because you can run your Linux apps in a Linux jail under FreeBSD. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so... Uh, uh, but yeah, and uh, somebody in the chat room asked about Vertio. Vertio is for virtualization. It's not the same as what you would use in a jail. Mm. If you're using Beehive, which is the new um, right. hypervisor, like a replacement for KVM, Zen, VMware, VirtualBox, etc., for FreeBSD, then you can use Vertio for the guest, and that's a completely virtualized network card, uh, whereas jails is a different system, and vImage just uses ePair devices uh, and you can create the virtual switching infrastructure. Um, hmm, nice. I think that the slides are up, but the video is not yet. Kirk McCusick gave a talk at BSD Can, which is two weeks ago now, uh, called "An Overview of Security in the FreeBSD Kernel," and it talks about secure levels and stuff. But then it gets into jails and vImage and how that security actually works, uh, and it's got a bunch of good diagrams. So I highly recommend you look at his slides and his uh, video once it's up. And I will, uh, let me just quickly check if the uh, slides are up yet. Ooh. And if they are, so I will include a link to them in the show notes awesome. for those of you who are interested. And I also just pasted it in the chat room All right, for people go. who can't wait for the show notes to come out. So go check the feedback <laughs> section of uh, episode 112 show notes, you guys, for that link. Okay, um, while, uh, while you tidy that up, I will read the next email from Miguel. And I butcher that name with love. It says, hi, in the last show it was mentioned, and good news, it's an OAuth question, uh, that OAuth, uh, it was mentioned that OAuth is an authorization, not authentication protocol. I'm currently implementing authentication mechanisms based on OAuth. It seems to me there is nothing wrong with that. Am I wrong? Thanks for the great show. Miguel. What do you say, well, using, using an application for something other than what it was meant for isn't probably the best thing to do. Uh, but I don't know all that much about OWASP in particular. Um, but basically, it's meant to control what an application can do on behalf of a user. Uh, in this case, using it to decide that you can log in kind of works, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I See tend what to agree, people were complaining about previous week and then decide for yourself. I would say this. I would like to put that out to you guys out there. Um, if you are in our subreddit, we always have a discussion thread there. Anywhere you're watching this, you can leave a comment. Your a little more thoughts on this because I don't really think either Al and I have a very strong stance on this. So I'd like to kind of get your input. From well, that. I just I've I've used OAuth like three times to connect an app to Twitter, and that's yeah. about it. I do Ever, kind of so. I do kind of go with your if it's not if that's not what the intention is for it, if that's not that that application's core function or focus, then it's generally not a good idea to use it for that. Even if you can shoehorn it in, it's just I don't know. But we'll see but what yeah. people say. It, lots of people are doing it. It doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, but there is, you know, open ID is better, but sometimes you don't have that choice. Yeah, sometimes you're working with something that requires something, you know, this and that. Or you're trying then to use what, thing. you know, if all your customers have a Twitter account and would rather use that to log in, then trying to make everybody switch to open ID will cause resistance, right? There you go. All right, let's move on to Jeff's email. Jeff writes in, he says, the company I work for is ready to purchase a load balancer, and I'm wondering what open source solutions would you guys suggest that fills this need? We are prepared to buy a commercial solution, but I would prefer to use something open. Any suggestions are appreciated. Thanks, Jeff. Well, he leaves out all the important details. <laughs> what is he trying to load balance? <laughs> Love. It's, it's hard to, to answer the question without knowing what it is he's trying to load balance. Uh, a really interesting load balancer that can work at level, uh, layer 3, 4, or 7 is RelayD, uh, which is for OpenBSD. Uh, I saw a really interesting talk about it at AsiaBSDCon, uh, and I know I've met the author a few times. Uh, him and I had a discussion about, he had tweeted, uh, at BSDCon, he had tweeted that every time he walked up to a group of people from FreeBSD, they were talking about ZFS. <laughs> and every time he walked up to a group of people uh, from OpenBSD, they were talking about beer or air travel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you suppose that means? <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, 
he wrote this uh, or helped write this application called RelayD, and I've a link here to a really good tutorial on how to use it for a bunch of different use cases. Yeah, uh, but it can do a, a lot of cool stuff, including uh, SSL interception, where it can load balance SSL by basically terminating the SSL and then making a new one. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, that's uh, and also, uh, Martin Matuska, who uh, works a lot on ZFS, actually, uh, has a project on GitHub to port RelayD to FreeBSD. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, that can work with pretty much any protocol. Uh, it has some special support for HTTPS and some other stuff, but mostly the advantage to RelayD is it's mostly socket level, right? So it's doing the things uh, at the lowest level so it can work with any application. Mm. Uh, it specifically takes advantage of a bunch of stuff in OpenBSD in, called uh, socket splicing, where basically once the application does the routing for the, uh, the load balancing, it lets the kernel handle all the pass. Uh, the, basically, you know, a connection comes in on the, this side of the app, and then it decides which pipe to send it out on the other side. And in a traditional load balancer, the load balancer would have to take care of passing all the traffic for the life of that connection. Mm -hmm. By using this system called socket splicing, RelayD basically connects those two pipes and hands it off to the kernel and lets it handle all the message passing. Oh. Uh, making it much faster. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but that specific is uh, that feature is specific to OpenBSD. Uh, I don't know if the port to FreeBSD is covering that as well or not. I kind uh, of I just assumed he was talking about a web accelerator uh, or load possibly. balancer. Yes, but you know it, it, what is he could be trying to load balance mail yeah. or some other application. You know I do a lot of load balancing of flash video streaming. Right. Turns and, out. And, yeah, <laughs> a bunch of other things. But what do you use is to nice do that? Uh, we do our load balancing with DNS. Right. Okay. We, do, we gave a talk in at uh, EuroBSDCon. The video is on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I linked it many episodes ago. Yeah. But you can find it. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure if you search for my name on. YouTube, it's one of the only videos. But anyway, um, if you're doing HTTP specifically, uh, Nginx is good. It's what I use for my HTTP load balancing uh, because you can do like different weights for your different backends, right? So if one server is bigger than the other, you can say, you know, give this most of the traffic and this, this portion of the traffic. Or here, use this backend only as a backup. So only if every other backend is down, then you should, should route traffic to this backend. Uh, Nginx is also really good at HTTPS. So you can do offloading. Right, have the load balancer do all the SSL CPU work, and then pass it to the backends not over SSL. Uh, very handy for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and Nginx originally was actually load balancer for mail as well, so it has a bunch of proxy stuff for mail. I had no idea. Yeah, it was one of the things that it was. It did, you know, like many open source uh, projects, it started as somebody having to scratch their itch. Yep. I, as I, that's funny you say that as I'm scratching my face. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, right, so, you know, he had a problem and he solves it with his little app, and then Nginx has since grown into this huge thing, uh, but it still maintains that functionality for uh, proxying mail connections. There you go. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's good for HTTP and HTTPS, and can do SSL offloading and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Varnish is also very good for as a load balancer because it has some health checking, and it can do things like sync mode. So if a backend is starting to throw errors or timeout or whatever... It will stop sending traffic to that backend for five minutes or whatever your sync mode time is to allow that backend to cool off and, and you know, be healthy again. Uh, and it has a bunch of what are called directors for deciding how to balance the traffic. And it also does caching in, in RAM. Which is Nginx this? can also do caching. This is Varnish? Uh, yes. Varnish does caching in RAM. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, Nginx can do caching to disk uh, with its hash-based proxy cache. Uh, so all those things uh, work very well. Varnish um, is the one that comes to my mind. Uh, I, I've i honestly... It, basically, Varnish won't do HTTPS, though. Okay, so it's, well, that's it's, good to know. Uh, but Varnish is really meant as a cache. Uh, and so if you're not going to do any caching, Nginx can be more useful sometimes. Uh, in our infrastructure, it's actually usually Varnish with Nginx as a backend, which then load balances to our fast CGI pools. I wish I could go in there as like a as like a contractor and look at his infrastructure because if I knew he had a good team and that mm -hmm. they had on-site expertise then I would say go this route but if it's like a if it's like a one man yeah, IT even, shop I might say with, go the commercial solution. Yeah, even with Nginx or Varnish if nobody 
that works there knows how to run these, that's going to be an issue. A huge issue. And if they break, it can take your system or your site offline. That's a huge yep. pressure choke point, and there's, that is, can be extremely stressful. And the nice thing about the commercial solution is it's probably going to be some sort of thing that sl slides in the rack, and it has a support contract. And Although, those... actually, PFSense has a web interface for configuring a load balancer and, and stuff for I can't believe uh, we haven't even... Of course, PFSense could do this, too. So that's worth looking yeah. at. And that, and that is gives a you a web easier. interface, and it gives you kind of that middle ground yeah. between something you can really customize to be work very specifically for your site and, you know, an off-the-shelf thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, or, PFSense or you know, there's system. there are, like, um, uh, there's... There's ways to get support for Varnish. There are commercial solutions based around Varnish, too. So if you just need right. HT HTTP load balancing and, and uh, yes. caching. Yeah, the, uh, the Varnish, uh, I think it's Linpro, I think is the name of the company that does the support for them. There you go. Yeah, I was just looking at it. Yeah, they have a commercial support section on their yep. uh, website. You can check that out. That's a good yes. question. It's a good question. All right. Uh, so. But yeah, so Thanks, Jeff. It, it really depends on a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, uh, Scale Engine has done... Varnish, uh, or you know, we worked as consultants with Varnish outside of Scale Engine as well. Oh yeah, we did uh, the Toronto Stars website for a long time, which the back end is actually ASP.NET on Windows servers, and we stuck FreeBSD servers with Varnish in front of it to keep them from dying. <laughs> I think Microsoft does that themselves, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. All right, well, thank you, Jeff, for your email. Uh, next email comes in from Simon, and he has a little LastPass tip for us. He says, Hi, guys. Just wanted to mention a tip to the question in episode 109 about hard-to-manage passwords on mobile devices, which I specifically complained about the fact that I'm I'm now completely in LastPass, and then I generate, like, these 22-character, you know, or longer passwords, and then I go to log into something on mobile, and it just all falls apart. Well, here's his solution. He says, I use LastPass on Firefox for Android, the Firefox mobile plugin, not the Android app, and it works perfectly. You don't have to set up your LastPass. You do have to set up your LastPass account to password iterations of only 500 instead of the default 5,000. Otherwise, Firefox will take a full minute to load. But uh, research on the internet shows that even a 500 iteration is sufficient. Keep up the great work with all of the shows, Simon. So yeah, I went over and. I have this, what do I have this installed on? I don't even know what devices I have this installed on, but I'm going to put it on my note right now. I'm going to install it on my note, and I'll give this a try. Because uh, I, I love, I like I like Firefox, so might as well give the, have you ever tried the mobile version, Alan? Might as well give it a try. Nope, I haven't. So, well, this might be a reason, because the last pass, I still have the issue with mobile big passwords is like individual apps, like the Twitter app, mm -hmm. or the Facebook app, where, you know, the web page login is, not because I had something like this for Dolphin for a long time too. Web page logins is only a small part of it, but it, it's at least part of it. All right, so go check that out, folks, if you're a LastPass user. All right, Keith writes in, and he just wanted to blow our minds for a little bit. He says, uh, "Dear Chris, he's talking to me because he was responding to something I mentioned uh, last episode in 110, where I got all up and hot and bothered about the NSA collecting emails, etc." He says, "I work for a tech support." for a leading backup and storage management software suite, in the course of my work, I got a call from the Department of Homeland Security that was looking for support in handling an Oracle backup performance problem. <laughs> a little backup performance problem, okay. In diagnosing this problem, I questioned the customer about the size of the database that was being backed up. He was very hesitant to discuss this with me. However, he eventually divulged that the Oracle database in question was 2.4 petabytes in size. Which is 2.5 million gigabytes. What makes this even more impressive is this was just right around 2009. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so could you imagine mm -hmm. now? A, a 2.4 petabyte? I, I just, that's, that's like, that's when you start talking about money in the trillions. That's just... Yeah, well, the really interesting thing is thinking about how many hard drives that would take just to hold it without, like, RAID redundancy. Yeah, I mean, just the cost in storage alone would be probably more than a lot of people make in their lifetime. <laughs> Think about that. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're talking like 900 three terabyte hard drives just to store the data. Well, and that was in 2009. Yes. And then, yes, also, you're not mentioning, you know, having to back it up. And yeah. the fact that it moves around. And if that's the size of the database, there are probably also log files and, yeah. you know, transaction logs and stuff. And you're just talking about huge amounts of data. I wonder if they do off-site backups. <laughs> I'm sure they have to. 
<laughs> to what? <laughs> What do you what do you back up to that's that can support a second one of those? Well, he must right because he was actually calling about a backup performance problem. <laughs> so yep. yeah, obviously they the, are backing the, up. Uh, the backup performance problem is we only have a ten gigabit link to the off offsite site. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we need more fiber. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I don't even know if you could back up that to Google's cloud. All right. Well, uh, thanks Keith for sending that in. That did blow our minds. Well, because you- yeah, that's game be minutes. Hours. I would love to get those guys on the show. It would show. take 23 days, or 24 days, to send 2.4 petabytes across the 10 gigabit fiber link if you maxed out the 10 gigabits the entire time. Assuming everything worked optimally. And then how do you yes. process that data? It's it's just at this point, it's just storing for storing purposes. I guess maybe you could write... To be searchable? <laughs> at some point, right? I mean, that's why you put it in a database, but I don't know. That's crazy to me. Now, you can email the show, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Links.techsnap.tv is the subreddit, and that's a great place to go because you can get your question answered faster, usually. And uh, then I don't have to go copy and paste it, and I love that. And, of course, you can always hit that contact link at the top of our website, fill out the form, just choose TechSnap from the dropdown. But, Alan, with the feedback all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories. They didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them, give you some links to follow up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links were provided by our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Alan, the uh, the first story in the Roundup kind of had us chuckling a little bit on the uh, live stream because yep. we're both kind of heavy users ourselves. I'm a Fios customer. I kind of feel like this guy's a little bit of my brother and only a little on the extreme side. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Verizon uh, cut off a customer after realizing he was using 77 terabytes of data a month. (laughs) (laughs) 77 terabytes. That's Well, in one month. I don't know if he did that every month. But just to put that in perspective, to use 77 terabytes in... I I think this is the sum of in and out. uh, But to do 77 terabytes in one direction in a month, you'd have to maintain 30 megabytes per second for the entire month. All 2,600 or 2,700,000, no, sorry again, 2,678,400 seconds that are in a month. Uh, so that's 240 megabits or 30 megabytes per second mm-hmm. constant for all 30 days of a month in order to do 77 terabytes. Uh, he's a 27-year-old Californian, and uh, he apparently uh, runs a few services out of his house. He also says he has some friends that use a personal VPN for video streaming from his house. He says he's involved in, you know, some light peer-to-peer file sharing. Uh, he's got a rack of servers with 209 terabytes of raw storage in his house. Um, <laughs> it sounds like they actually I've, got a picture of the rack. Says, he, he works for a, a backup company or something, right? Yeah. And he's doing some testing. Here's the gear he's got in his house. He's got a one U server that acts as a VPN server with four point, uh, with, oh, I'm sorry, with four 1.5 terabyte disks. He's got another one U server, another two U server, and then a four U Solaris ZFS backup machine that has 24 one terabyte disks. Then he has another four U server with 15 3 terabyte disks, then a 2U Windows server, then a 2U uh, power uh, uh, um, battery, and another 4U Solaris CFS server with 24 1 terabyte disks. <laughs> Really sounds like you should be co-locating some of that stuff just to have better connection. Yeah, well, he got like this monster 300 megabit FIOS package, and he's like, I'm good. I'll just use it on here. Of course, the terms of service of the uh, FIOS package um, are, say, no servers. And it's it's like a $340 a month plan, and they say no servers. Yep. And I guess they called him up, and they were very short. They're like, they didn't tell him to stop. They just told him, get on a business plan. And he said, okay. And then Mm -hmm. they hung up. And (laughs) that was it. And like... You would think the MPAA would be like, uh, excuse me, uh, I'd like to take a look at those hard drives. Well, uh, maybe Verizon is one of the only ones that's not owned by a media company, right? I guess they own some media stuff, but yeah, I don't know. related to a, media, a movie studio that I know of off the top of my head. He's probably just been good and used encryption, so he hasn't had any reason to uh, trip yeah, any. It sounds mostly like it's VPN traffic, right? Yeah, yeah. That is super funny. I wonder, yeah. Hmm. And work stuff. But yeah, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's talk another China story here. China blamed yes. after, uh, remind me what ASIO blueprints are. Alan, what are ASIO? Uh, ASIO is the Australian Security Intelligence Organization. Oh, it's excellent. Like their 
Right. Yeah. In fact, this was a story that I didn't get a chance to read, so I didn't cover it in Unfilter when we were covering the China stuff. So it's yes. awesome we're covering it here. All right, tell me about this. Yeah. Uh, so basically, one of the contractors that helped build the new headquarters of the ASIO was targeted in an attack, uh, which apparently originated from a server in China. Mm. Uh, and basically, from the contractor, they managed to steal the blueprints for the building and uh, some schematics for some of the security system and stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's a pretty big deal. And then uh, one of the news magazines posted a video uh, where it's a bunch of interviews and stuff, and it kind of describes how the attack took place. Oh, interesting. And uh, they also interview a couple of people about why it matters. You know, it's like, oh, it's just the blueprints of the building. What does that matter? But, you know, that can be very useful information if you're trying to plant bugs in the building or oh, sure. know where you can cut to disconnect their phone lines and stuff or... You know, you know, lots of different things. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I've told the story on this show before about how when I worked at a bank, we would have, um, for FDIC regulation, we would have um, auditors come in and, and check our security. And uh, they would often show up with Windows file shares on their machine open. And in some cases, they had documents to share like amongst the little team they would bring with them and they would have like other customers folders in there and then when they would plug into our our network to do a vulnerability assessment well while they were plugged in that share would be accessible so i would i would go grab it and i would mm -hmm. just hold on to it and if they gave us a particularly bad review <laughs> i'd be like well just to put things in perspective here's their share and that actually yep. came up and they ate a little humble pie <laughs> and <laughs> of course i was the young jackass but uh, the yep. contractors, my point, and keep in mind that I am a contractor, uh, or at least have been for years, uh, are often the source of the right. leak. In, in this particular to... case, contractor actually means the people who built the building, like construction contractor, not oh. IT contractor. Oh, well, it's usually the IT contractor that gets blamed because they don't right, have to follow the same security standards or, or right. whatever. In this case, you know, it was the you know, concrete building and rebar contractors. Well, how are you going to know if your building contractor has a good IT security policy before you have them exactly. build Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tough spot. Kind of seems like the kind of thing you cover when it's in intelligence headquarters, and yeah. you probably require everybody that works on the site to have at least some level of security clearance. You mean something like due diligence, Alan? Yeah, hmm. basically. <laughs> it's like, I, I remember when, uh, hearing about when my dad worked as an iron worker building a nuclear plant here in Ontario. You know, everybody had to have uh, the baseline uh, security certificate, basically mm. the lowest grade security clearance, right? They did a basic background check on everybody to make sure that all mm. the people working to build the nuclear power plant weren't doing anything right. malicious. And they so weren't on. sneaky. Yes. And they, who, they were who they said they were and things like that. All right, Apache admins, put your shields up because our next roundup story applies to you. A log file vulnerability has been found in the Apache server. A security hole that allows attackers to take control of the server has been found in Apache. The vulnerability is contained in the do rewrite log log function of the mod underscore rewrite module. This function insufficiently filters the data that is written to the log file. Attackers can potentially use this specially crafted HTTP request to inject escape sequences into the log file, which could possibly cause the server to execute commands with without the administrator's authorization when the log file is displayed in the terminal. <laughs> so when you're catting your file, and you get hacked. Uh, versions 2.2.x of Apache are vulnerable, but other branches may also be affected. Currently, the only way of mitigating the issue is to apply a patch. Red Hat Enterprise Linux users will find the issue has been fixed in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 and 6. No comment on other major vendors at this time. So patchy. Yeah. Uh, so apparently, yeah. Uh, when it <laughs> logs, it can log shell code, and if you load that up in your terminal in the wrong program, it can cause it to execute stuff. Yeah, probably wouldn't be cat that would probably execute it. Cat would probably be a safe thing. I'm not to, sure. I mean, yeah. less is the safest one because it it displays it in a strange way instead of letting it execute or something. But uh, I'm not sure. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Apache or Apache. And it also could uh, be especially vulnerable if it's something to do with um, uh, like a log parser. Like if oh, you're yeah, using totally. uh, yeah. Austats or something, yeah. Yeah. then, you know, yeah. all, if you could just unescape a quote mark or something, you could cause the Perl script to go all kinds of hair. Yeah, AW Stats uses Perl, and it's just, I bet that totally could be interesting. Yep. Mm. All right, let's talk about the story. A closer look at the recent uh, privilege escalation bug that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks that's in the Linux kernel. Yep. 
Um, yeah. yeah, so this is just a blog post that kind of delves into what's what actually going on a, a bit more. Yeah. It's, it's the uh, TLDR is this article is going to explain how a recent privilege privilege escalation bug for the Linux kernel works. <laughs> yeah, That's and it cool. kind of talks about uh, sysctls and, and so on. Good link. Or, uh, sys, uh, system calls, not sysctls. Well, we got another uh, PayPal uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. Uh, Robert. Well, this one made uh, a lot more news because of the person behind it and so on, and the, the scandal around it rather than the actual vulnerability itself. Robert Cougar? Mm -hmm. Cougar? Uh, so basically, a uh, researcher found a uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability in PayPal's site where basically if you typed, if you caused a certain string to be used as the search string, it would run the JavaScript that you injected as part of the search string. Mm. Uh, and he submitted this to PayPal's bug bounty program, and they rejected it. Right, I heard about this. Because he's only 17 years old, uh, they didn't. They wouldn't pay him for it, and so he disclosed it publicly instead. You know that's that is ridiculous. If you got if you've discovered something, I mean, I, maybe they. I guess maybe there's some sort. Of, it must be a legal thing. Probably it's probably mostly just cover your ass. You know, yeah. it's, like I, you're not actually entering into any kind of contract that I recall. Uh, but you know, there's the possibility that did there's they when like you that. reported something, did they pay you via PayPal? Yes. That's okay. the only way they will do it. And do you have to be 18 to have a PayPal account? Um, I don't think so. Possibly. Maybe PayPal just doesn't know that people under the age of 18 use computers. Maybe they just haven't figured that it's, out yet. It's probably more likely a legal department said that's a good disclaimer to have in there and, and you know, people are just following. Uh, apparently PayPal is reviewing that policy now to see if it's possible for them to accept people under 18. Oh, yeah, yeah. According to the chat room, uh, you said you do need to be 18 to have a PayPal account. So I'm an old man you now. You didn't at one time, because I had one when I was 16. Oh, maybe you were just a hack whore. Um, so yeah, um, so that, must, that well, might be part of it. I guess there was somebody to, else who's I also... I get a notarized letter of authorization to use my dad's credit card, because I didn't have a credit card yet. And when I needed to verify the account, I had to attach a credit card. I guess So I just was, needed uh, a, a notarized letter of authorization that I had to fax them. Okay, okay, I see. Hmm. To say that I was actually allowed to use uh, the credit card. Well, there you go. Well, I, you know, now, so hopefully they fix it, <laughs> by the mm -hmm. way. All right, so next. Uh, this, uh, yes, I think this has already been fixed, actually. Oh, okay. Okay, so the next story in the roundup has an awesome picture. Uh, Hard-coded ICS credentials getting easier to find. Hi ICS credentials? Who, what? ICS being uh, industrial control system? Mm, yeah. So basically, in this particular one, there's this device called the Turk BL20 and a BL67. Uh, and basically, they have an FTP server built in. And uh, it has a username and password that are built into the firmware so that the manufacturer can connect to the device. But somebody downloaded the firmware and went through it and eventually found that password. And so they're able to just log into that any one of these devices, of which there are hundreds, and disrupt them in lots of different ways. Uh, and it, the post goes on to talk about a tool that somebody's building that looks for, basically, you've heard of the strings command in Linux, right? Or any Unix. Sure. It basically goes to a binary file and pulls out all the strings of text. Uh, well, this is basically a smarter version of that that can figure out which bits of text are out of context and are just random islands of text in the middle of nothing and are very likely to be passwords or other hard-coded credentials, or other useful bits of information. Uh, and Because I've done that before, actually. Uh, gone through a binary file with strings and you know, ignored a bunch of stuff and eventually sifted through and found the password that was built into a file mm -hmm. and used that to break the encryption on something. Um, and so this is basically a tool that would automate that. And so basically warning ICS uh, vendors that you need to stop hard-coding you know, it's been a security no-no for a long time, but people still do it. Industrial control systems are the worst place to have these bad practices, yep. too. Yep. All right. Well, I've got some good news for QuickTime fans, Alan. Uh, patch is out. Go patch your QuickTime. Apple yep. updates QuickTime for 12 vulnerabilities. Count them, folks. 12 it's vulnerabilities. Specifically QuickTime for Windows. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, apparently there's if a certain malicious MP3, MP4, and other video files and audio files uh, could basically cause an exploit 
on if you play them in QuickTime. Or if you have QuickTime associated with JPEG, QTIF files, uh, they also could. Also a bunch of yeah. vulnerabilities in uh, if a, a specifically maliciously crafted JPEG could crash or infect your system. I got to give them, I just gave them a hard time about their crappy uh, information. But if uh, they link in the threat post article to the Apple mailing list where they actually give actual details on what these vulnerabilities are. So look at that. Well, most of the vulnerabilities probably have a CVE number, right? And look, they even signed it. Nice. Uh, it's just, I mean, that's yes, they do. You're right. But this is just a little above and beyond what, they've, what I've normally seen from them on some of this stuff. So that's right. cool. They're getting it, which is awesome. Well, this is probably a different team, right? Because this is QuickTime, which has been around a lot longer. You're probably and it's right. QuickTime for Windows, right? It's, right? it's probably not quite the same. Right. As, as and I was actually before, thinking of like stuff. iOS updates and stuff like that, right. where they're, or OS X updates where they've been very brief in the past. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think that brings us to the end, doesn't it, Alan? Uh, no, there's one more story. Oh, okay, good, good. Oh, that's right, the one with the jillion links, yeah. yeah. That's why I didn't have it in my tab, because there's so many links. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Google researchers, two different sets of them actually, uh, found 13 different critical flaws in Flash Player and, announced, and sent them to Adobe, and Adobe has uh, published Flash Player 11.7.700.202, uh, which has the fixes for all of these. Google's really got just their researcher guys just all over the place. Well, I'm guessing it has something to do with the fact that they bundle Flash Chrome. and Chrome. Yeah. And they were doing some testing. Yeah, good on them. And, or, uh, or they've also you know, seen exploits being tried to use against them and a bunch of other things as well, I imagine. These uh, all look identical. All these posts look exactly identical. Well, if they also have uh, sequential CVE numbers, right? Yeah. It's basically every CVE number from 3324 to 3335. Yeah. I have and then a, an older one, uh, 27, 28. You can, you can kind of see them in the list that I have here. But we'll have them all linked in the show notes. It's kind of yeah. funny. Good for Google. Uh, I, yeah. wanted, I would just love to see Flash I wonder go if away this so bad. Is Adobe shared the source code for Flash with Google as part of the bundling in Chrome? Yes, I think there was and a deal And they're actually there. auditing it and finding these vulnerabilities through code audit rather than, you know, testing? I think that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, I think and I remember that. that's a good that. thing, yeah, right? It that means is. that fixing all this uh, it, stuff in Flash. You know, well, honestly, my first reaction when I saw that is this must be a result of that deal. And then my second reaction was why the hell is it taking Google to find these problems? Why is Adobe not finding these problems? <laughs> well, if you're a fancy security researcher and you have two different job opportunities, Adobe or Google, which one are you going to take? Okay, so you're saying maybe it's not Adobe's fault that people just don't want to work for them? <laughs> well, if, if people have the choice of working at Google on yeah. lots of different projects yeah. or Adobe, you're right. I would pick Adobe Google. Software. I would pick Google. I would. You're right. It, that might be part of it. Well, thank goodness that Google is shining their light on Flash for the good of all of humanity. Yep. That's what I say to that. And uh, this is the upside to them bundling it in Chrome, I suppose. Um, and as long as we can just get that live streaming piece solved, I'm ready for Flash to go away like that. Just like that. Well, HLS kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. But not as smooth as Flash. Flash no. really still has it, you know. Well, because that's, yeah, Flash is actually live, where HLS is actually... Like reassembling it, right? Well, it's, it's a bunch of really short recordings of a live stream. Yeah. So you're basically, you're loading a playlist of three of the last 10 seconds of the live stream. It's just over and over and over again. And the playlist keeps refreshing, right? Uh, so yeah, that's why the iPhone stream is 30 seconds behind the live stream. We can do shorter ones, but the performance degrades really quickly as you get shorter bursts because yeah. there's more overhead every time. Right, and see, the nice, the, the nice thing about a, a low delay is the chat room interaction is a yep. lot better. So Flash yep. is, you know, we get a lot of people on Linux Action Show, they're like, oh, I showed up to watch the Linux Action Show live and you had a Flash player on your website, and so I closed your window. That's why there's an RTSP link right underneath I it. So. I know. They, you know what? They just also, they wanted to be the upset. Best, the best way to play the stream on Linux, though, is RTMP dump piped into VLC or M player? Oh, really? RT then you get it, you're getting the RTMP stream, but then playing it in VLC or M player. Why does RTMP dump do it better than VLC directly? Because VLC doesn't have RTMP support built in, does it? Oh. It, last time I checked. Okay. Didn't know that. I, I could have sworn it did. I mean, it seems like. Uh, FFmpeg has it now, so newer ver versions might. The mm. older ones didn't. Cool. Uh, the, the VLC will play the HLS stream, but that has this 30 second delay. Right, right. Very nice. All right. Well, that, I believe, brings us to the end of this week's show. And don't forget, TechSnap's live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. 
over at jblive.tv and jblive.info where you can get the audio versions of this show, which is good for you commuters or those of you stuck at your desk with that chain and they don't want you streaming video because they're mean. That's why we have that for you guys. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. Bye.